What's going on guys? Hope everyone is doing well. I'm here with episode two of the new camera flying skills series here on the channel. We're going to be doing today's episode about photography 101. So let's get started right now. So by definition, photography is the art, application and practice of creating durable images by recording light or other electromagnetic radiation, either electronically via an image sensor or chemically using any light sensitive material such as photographic film. Of course, photography is much more than that, but in today's episode, we will dissect that definition and take a look at the variants that go into taking a picture. In modern days, everyone has a camera, either on their phone, on their helmets or on their camera bags, of course. These cameras vary widely in function and ease of use. But when it comes down to it, they all have the same function. Light being captured by a lens, distorted and projected onto an image sensor or piece of photographic film, and later being revealed on a piece of paper or on a screen. For this episode, we will take a look at the factors that make taking a picture possible and not consider the cameras being used. The key component of a picture is light. Light is exactly what makes photography possible. In reality, we're just capturing reflected light. So the way we, or our camera, decides to take the picture is what's gonna have the most impact on that photo. The way light gets exposed on the image sensor is what's going to create the picture. So it's important for the photographer to understand how that works. In order to understand photography, we first need to understand the concept of exposure. Exposure is the amount of light per unit area reaching the sensor. An image that looks too dark or underexposed has less light hitting the sensor. On the other hand, an image that looks too bright, overexposed, has more light hitting the sensor. In order to balance these things out and create an evenly exposed picture, we must work with what's called the exposure triangle, which are the three key main things we can change on our camera, which are aperture, shutter speed and ISO. These are basically the three pillars of photography. Any camera that has an automatic mode has something called a light meter. What the light meter does is it takes the image being projected onto, this, onto the sensor, it picks up the brightest portion of the image, the darkest portion of the image, creates an average and adjusts the exposure triangle accordingly in order to give you a properly exposed image. This is what you will see when you have a DSLR or a mirrorless camera and you shoot in program mode. In your phone or in your GoPro, it comes automatically programmed to automatic mode and there's, you're really limited to what you can change. If you have a DSLR or a mirrorless camera, you can pick it up now and bring it along the video as I explain the different parameters of the exposure triangle. I will make a video dedicated to each type of camera and different lenses, but in this today's video, we're only going to be focusing on the main pillars of photography, which is the exposure triangle. Let's start with the simplest of the factors, which is shutter speed. Shutter speed refers to how long your sensor is exposed to light. There are two curtains in front of the image sensor that when you press the button to take the picture, which is called the shutter release, activates a motor that makes those two curtains go down and expose your image sensor to a calibrated amount of time. This time is measured in fractions of a second. You can have one four thousandths, one two hundredths of a second, one tenth of a second. The fastest shutter speeds will expose your sensor to the least amount of light. On the other hand, the slowest shutter speeds will expose your sensor to the most amount of light. Think of light as a hose hitting your sensor. The particles of water are like photons in this analogy. The longer the sensor is exposed, the more water will get to hit the sensor. On the other hand, if the sensor is only exposed for a short amount of time, not a lot of photons will be able to hit it. A faster shutter speed will create a darker image. But at the same time, because the interval of time being captured is much shorter, it will freeze up your action, the action of the picture much better, creating a sharper, more focused picture. On the other hand, a slower shutter speed will give you a brighter image, but because the moment the picture was taken is much longer, your subject might have more time to move, therefore creating a little bit of what we call motion blur. In the example you're seeing on the screen, I was pushing the lens. When I was using a faster shutter speed, you can see the lens fro froze up and appear appeared static. When I was using a slower shutter speed, we have a little bit of trailing and motion blur because the sensor was exposed for a longer, a longer amount of time. In order to avoid getting a very bright or very dark picture, we must compensate using the other two aspects of the exposure triangle. The way we pick our shutter speed depends on what subject we are shooting. If we're shooting a landscape, 
it's not gonna run away, it's not gonna move. So we don't need a fast shutter speed. We can use a slower shutter speed. But if we're shooting a moving subject, especially a fast moving subject, we're gonna need a faster shutter speed. For instance, birds or a skydiver in the sky that are moving much faster. We also should take in consideration that if we're handhelding a camera or it's on our heads, we should try to have faster shutter speeds in order to compensate for the movement of our hands and our body. If you're shooting a landscape, you can't go down and have super slow shutter speeds because even though your subject's not moving, your hands are moving and are going to create some blur. When you have the camera on your helmet, it's not going to be too stable because you're falling, the wind is moving your head a little bit, so it's better to have faster shutter speeds. We will cover that a bit further out in the into the video. Luckily in skydiving, we have a giant light source in the sky, the sun. So we have a lot of light in order, and we are able to expose our sensor for a very short amount of time. But it's important to take in consideration that when using automatic mode on your camera, if you're shooting indoors or in a very dark sunset situation during a jump, the camera might decide to take a longer shutter speed, therefore creating blurry images. If having a sharp image is a priority, we have something on cameras called shutter priority, which will mean we will only be able to change the shutter speed and the camera will decide the rest for us. On Canon cameras, it's called TV for time value. On Sony cameras, it's just called S for speed. By going to your mode dial and setting it to S or TV, you will be able to change your shutter speed and decide which shutter speed you want to use, and the camera will choose aperture and ISO for you, if you have auto ISO. In an ideal world, you would just be shooting at the fastest shutter speed your camera can take, but since we don't always have a lot of light available, this is not always possible. Most cameras can shoot as long as 30 seconds of exposure time for artistic night shots with uh, star trails and can go as fast as one four thousandths of a second. Professional cameras can shoot up to eight thousandths of a second using a mechanical shutter and one thirty-two thousandths of a second using electronic shutter for some of the high-end mirrorless cameras. Let's now move to the second part of the exposure triangle, which is ISO. ISO might be one of the most complex parts to explain because it has a lot of history, but just sit tight. ISO refers to the sensitivity of film to light. Back in the days of film photography, we would use 35mm film as our image sensor. The this film was filled with something called silver halide crystals. These crystals were randomly placed on a film gelatin and, when hit with light photons, turned dark. By creating an area filled with these tiny silver halide crystals, we were able to create something called photographic film. The areas of film that were exposed to more light would have more of their crystals turn dark, therefore creating a dark spot on the film. And, on the other hand, the parts of the film that were exposed to the least amount of light would remain silver and transparent because of the gelatin. This would create an image negative that would later be stabilized through a chemical treatment process called development that basically removed the light sensitivity from the crystals to preserve the image negative and later developed into a black and white picture onto paper. Later we were able to create different crystals that were sensitive to different types of wavelengths of electromagnetic radiation resulting in film that was color sensitive Let's get back to the simple black and white silver halide crystals. The amount of light photons hitting each crystal would determine the exposure of an image. If a crystal was hit with more light photons, it would turn darker. If it was hit with less light photons, it would remain transparent. Sometimes, even with the slowest shutter speeds and the widest apertures, there wasn't enough light to properly expose our image with the film we were using. Maybe we just wanted to use a faster shutter speed and we couldn't because the image was coming out too dark and if we used a slower shutter speed the image would come out blurry. So eventually film manufacturers came up, came up with a solution, creating a film that had bigger crystals that had more surface area. This would mean that with a greater area more light photons were able to hit each crystal. But on the other hand we were able to fit less crystals onto a single piece a film, creating an image that was grainy, had less resolution and more noise. The unit of measure for ISO is called film speed. Back in the days of film, we had film speeds ranging from 100 ISO, which had a lot of very tiny crystals, all the way up to ISO 1600, which had bigger crystals and therefore less of them. In modern day cameras, the same principle is applied. The lower the ISO speed, the less light sensitivity the camera sensor will have. The cons of using high ISO numbers in modern cameras are similar to film, 
we will have a noisier, more grainy image. The only difference being the resolution will remain the same because in film, you would have bigger crystals and less crystals. With image sensors, the image sensor has a predefined number of pixels that have a predefined area. The only thing that changes is the sensitivity they have to light. Modern cameras have changeable ISO, which means that you will no longer have to carry multiple rolls of film and be stuck all day with a wrong roll on your camera. With fast processors, new cameras can have speeds of ISO ranging from 100 all the way up to 51,200. In native mode and using expandable mode, we can go upwards of 300,000. Using expanded ISO means that you are going beyond the process, the capabilities of your camera's processor. So this means that the image will come up much worse. I would recommend staying in native ISO. My personal camera goes up to ISO 25,600 and can even go more with expanded ISO, but I usually keep it under 1,600 because I want to avoid grainy, noisy images. One last important aspect of ISO, just like film, is that with bigger pixel area comes better ISO performance. If a pixel is bigger, it will be able to capture more light photons. This means that with the same image processor, a sensor with 20 megapixels will have better ISO performance than a sensor with 40 megapixels because the pixel area is larger. A bigger sensor will also have bigger pixel area because a sensor with a bigger area with the same megapixels as a sensor with a smaller area will have proportionately smaller pixels. But sensor size will be talked about in a future video. This is the reason why professional sports cameras that have less megapixels are way more expensive than studio professional cameras with a lot of megapixels. As you can see by these two examples, the Canon 1DX Mark III has 20 megapixels and costs about 6,000 euros. On the other hand, a landscape or portrait studio photography camera like the Canon 5D Mark IV or in this case the 5D SR has 50 megapixels and costs 1,600 euros. Bigger pixels will give us more light sensitivity, which means that we can have faster ISOs, therefore faster shutter speeds as well, giving us a sharper, more clear image, which is good for sports for freezing the action. Finally, the last aspect, which is aperture. Aperture, in theory, is pretty simple, but it comes with very complex side effects. It's basically the amount of light that goes through the lens. It's measured in f-stops, and the lower the f-stop, the wider the aperture and the more light comes in. On the other hand, the higher the f-number, the smaller the hole, which means the least light will come through. A regular standard zoom lens will usually have an aperture that goes as fast as f4, which means your aperture blades will open up to at four. Professional zoom lenses will go all the way as fast as f2.8, which is going to give you a wider aperture, letting more light come through. If you have a fixed focal length or a prime lens, as we call them, which is basically a lens that cannot zoom in or out, you are able to have a wider aperture because you have less elements moving inside. And usually it's going to give you at about f1.8 or f1.4 or even f1.2 if you're going up really expensive. It's going to give you a super wide aperture, letting in a lot of light. The benefits of getting more light onto the sensor are pretty obvious. You're going to have faster shutter speeds, and you can use lower ISOs for better image performance. The downsides of using a large aperture are, first of all, the price, because the more light coming through the lens means there's, there needs to be more glass to capture that light. And with the glass being the most expensive piece of your camera, the more glass you're using, the more expensive the glass is going to be, so the more expensive your lenses are going to be. If you have a zoom lens with an aperture of 2.8, it's usually going to be super expensive. If you have a prime with an average of 1.8, it's usually going to be pretty cheap. But if you go up to 1.2, it's going to go up to thousands in price. Using a fast aperture can also cause vignetting on your image or chromatic aberrations. This is caused because you're using a very big piece of glass in front of your lens and you're allowing more light to be refracted and cause all sorts of problems. And also, because you're using the full width of your lens, you're gonna, you might have some vignetting because the aperture is so wide, you're gonna start to see a little bit of the corners of the image, even though you're not changing your field of view. But by far the biggest aspect of having wider apertures is the reduced depth of field. The wider the aperture, the shallower your depth of field will be. This means that a smaller distance in front of your lens will be in focus. As you can see from the image on the screen right now, 
the first lens is in focus while the second lens is, is out of focus and blurred out with the background. But if I increase the f-stop, which means I'm making the hole smaller on the lens, I'm going to have the other lens much more in focus. Having the background out of focus and using a wide aperture is good for portraits because you get to really concentrate the image on your subject by blurring out the background and making everything disappear and the image is really focused on the subject. But if you're taking pictures of multiple people or of multiple subjects that are further away from each other and you want to keep them both in focus, it's better to use a smaller aperture to keep everything in focus. Most cameras have a dedicated aperture priority mode. In Canon cameras, it's called AV, which is aperture value. And in Sony cameras, it's just called A for aperture. This means that you get to regulate the aperture with a control dial and the camera decides shutter speed and ISO if you have auto ISO turned on. So let's quickly review all three aspects. First, shutter speed. Faster shutter speeds means less light but sharper images. Slower shutter speeds means more light but blurry images. High ISOs means a lot of light sensitivity but images are grainy. Low ISOs means less light sensitivity but the images will be clearer and sharper. And a wide aperture means that more light's coming in but you have a shallower depth of field and a more blurry background. On the other hand, a smaller aperture means that less light's coming in, but you'll have a wider depth of field, having more things in focus. To summarize, let's talk about the best settings for skydiving situations. Firstly, let's analyze what our conditions and what our scene look like. When taking pictures of people skydiving, whether it be a tandem jump or your friends doing a fun jump, you're usually going to be jumping on a very sunny day. It's kind of a prerequisite for skydiving. Even if it's kind of cloudy, you're gonna have the sun above you and the clouds beneath you acting as a huge re light reflector, which is gonna mean you're even gonna have more light. With that being said, wh what are the perfect settings for skydiving? Let's go through the three main, main ones, shall we? Starting with shutter speed. Since with skydiving, we are using a wide angle lens, it means that we can go for slower shutter speeds. But because skydiving is a sport, we want the shutter speed to be high Relative, relative to the width of the lens in order to create a sharp image. Let's estimate that in skydiving you use between a 10 millimeter and a 20 millimeter camera lens on a crop sensor. Again, we will talk about crop sensors and full frame sensors and different lenses in a future video. But let's take into consideration the 10 millimeter, which is the field of view you're watching here right now, or and the 20 millimeter, which is like this. Estimating without image stabilization, handhelding a picture, you can go as low as 1 60th of a second. With image stabilization, you can usually go up to 1 20th of a second. But since conditions are pretty good, we can usually keep it safe and have triple or quadruple digits on our shutter speeds. Between 1 200th of a second and 1 1000th of a second, depending on the time of day, the light available, and the lens you're using. When it comes to ISO, 90% of the days you're, you're jumping on a bright sunny day. So what I would do is keep that ISO nice and low, setting it to manual and just going for the 100 ISO to get a clean, sharp image. If you are doing a sunset dive, I would probably play it safe, set ISO up to 200, and if you're doing a cloudy, dark sunset dive, maybe ISO 400. This way, you will always guarantee your shutter speeds are fast. But again, I personally recommend manual ISO, especially because skydiving has very good conditions and you don't have radical changes. You'll have maybe three or four stops of changes, so setting ISO to manual is a pretty good idea. Another option, which I have seen done, and I personally do, is set ISO to auto, but limit it between 100 and 400 ISO. This means I can have very fast shutter speeds, and the camera will always keep the, those shutter speeds uh, fast, because it will try to grab the, the, the fastest ISO possible. But then again, if you let the camera decide between having slower shutter speeds or faster ISOs, it will also always choose faster ISOs. And I like the look of a 100 ISO image. When it comes to aperture, I'd say this is one of the most important aspects. Your camera during a jump, because the camera flyer is always moving in relation to the, to the subject he's shooting, whether it be just a little bit or a lot, and the, the autofocus motor on the lens and the autofocus servo on your camera will constantly be making adjustments. So if we give it just a very shallow depth of field to work with, it's gonna have more trouble focusing fastly and correctly. So I would recommend closing down your aperture a little bit because there's a lot of light available and the benefits of having the whole subject in focus and having it in focus faster will give you more images 
sharper images with the whole thing in focus and just because you have so much light they will still be fast with fast shutter speeds. If you have a lens that goes all the way as wide as f4, I would recommend you stop it down to f6.3 because when you have your lens set to the widest aperture, you can again, as I mentioned, have chromatic aberrations and vignetting. So closing it down a little bit will give you the cleanest, best image and using 6.3 or 5.6 will give you a deep depth of field. The best range of performance for camera lenses is usually in zoom lenses between f5.6 and f8 and in primes, is usually all the way um, down to from 2.8 all the way up to f8. From f8 you will have ghosting and refraction and below that at f1.8 or f1.4 you will have chromatic aberrations and vignetting. So for primes 2.8 or maybe higher is the recommended amount for the zoom lenses between 5.6 6.3 is what I would recommend. And again if you have very good conditions, I would close down your lens up to f4 if you have a prime or f5.6 f if you have a prime to really have a deep depth of field. So, in the end, what settings should you use for your jumps? Well, with all of this video being said, with you now knowing all that you know about settings and what to do, I would still recommend, if you're a beginner, to use sports mode. Sports mode is reliable and will make your camera shoot the best way possible for a sports situation, as the name implies. If you have a prime lens and with a fast aperture, I would recommend you use aperture priority mode. This will allow you to use a fast aperture, but stop it down a little bit in order to have a deeper depth of field and in order to remove a little bit of the chromatic aberrations and vignetting. If you set your camera to sports mode and your lens has a very wide aperture, the camera will open up the aperture as much as it can in order to get as much light as possible and faster shutter speeds as possible. So, setting it to aperture priority will mean that you will get to decide the aperture that you want. I also set my ISO to manual and just leave it at 100 and then let the camera decide the shutter speed because with a wide aperture of f2.8 or f4, the shutter speeds are usually gonna be pretty fast. For a low light jump, like a sunset dive or a really cloudy late jump, it's smart to set the camera to manual, set the aperture to the widest it can go and set a shutter speed to something that's slow but still usable. You should know more or less what your camera system can handle, especially if you have image stabilization on your lens or on your body, on your camera's body. But it's also always smart to keep it above 1 one hundredths of a second or 1 one or 2 hundredths of a second. And then set the ISO to auto and put a limiter at 800 ISO or 1000 ISO. This way the camera can decide between 100 ISO and 1600 ISO or 800 ISO and give you a properly exposed image. Remember that you sh must give your camera room to choose. You should all, all in free fall you should always have at least one of the parameters decided by the camera so that the camera can make adjustments as you are moving and filming more of the sky which is more lit up or more of the earth which is more dark and you shouldn't have one of the parameters maxed out when you're taking an average picture so for instance if i'm just taking a picture of the subject precisely how i want it and it's set to iso 100 and i'm using the iso as the variant for the camera to decide as soon as i point the picture to something brighter the picture will end up being overexposed because the camera can't go any lower than 100 ISO. So do keep an eye, an eye out for that. With all this being said, I know this was a long episode, but I needed to cover this in order to give you guys some information about all of the things I'm going to talk in the future videos. You, I mentioned crop sensors, wide angle lenses and stabilizer, image stabilizers, and we will cover that in the next video. So stay tuned for that. If you have any questions or complimentary information you would like to add, you can do so freely in the comment section down below. And as always, have a good day.